Good evening, everyone. We have um, Dr. Garcia with us, our Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion um, Advisor or Officer mm -hmm. um, with us. And she's going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Jeffries to us all. Thank you so much, Request. Yes, what a pleasure it is to be back. Um, uh, beaming in from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and just so pleased to have Dr. Jeffries here. And this was definitely uh, an initiative of um, Shaquez, our assistant director of the CDIO, who was like, we need to do something really good for um, Juneteenth. And her, uh, you know, her spirit and her commitment really drove us to look for Dr. Jeffries, who has been a great partner for the College of Worcester in these events. And so we were thrilled to have him join us. So I'm gonna give a quick introduction to Dr. Jeffries and then pass the um, floor to you. Um, so Hassan Kwame Jeffries teaches, researches, and writes about the African-American experience from a historical perspective. He has chronicled the civil rights movement in the 10 episode Audible original series, Great Figures of the Civil Rights Movement and has told the remarkable story of the original Black Panther Party in Bloody Lounges. Bloody Lounges, uh -huh. Lounge. Bloody Lounges, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Second language speaker. Civil <laughs> rights and Black power in Alabama's Black Belt, which has been praised as, quote, the book historians of the Black freedom movement have been waiting for. That sounds amazing. Hassan has collaborated on several public history projects and served as the lead scholar and primary scriptwriter for the 27 million renovation of the National Civil Rights Museum at the Lorraine Hotel in Memphis, Tennessee, the site of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Hassan regularly shares his expertise on African-American history and contemporary black politics through public lectures, op-eds and interviews with print, radio and television news outlets he has also contributed to several, several documentary film projects as a featured on-camera scholar, including the Emmy nominated for our PBS documentary, Black America Since MLK and uh, Still I Rise. That is Maya Angelou's mm -hmm. amazing poem, right? Great. Um, his commitment to teaching hard history led him to edit Understanding and Teaching for Civil Rights, The Civil Rights Movement, a collection of essays by leading civil rights scholars, and teachers that explores how to teach civil rights history accurately and effectively, and to host the podcast Teaching Hard History, a production of the Southern Poverty Law Center's Teaching Tolerance Division. Impressive, Dr. Jeffries, it's just wonderful. And you're so kind to write, you know, to, to encourage us to use your first name, but I'm like, you know, I'm like so proud just to be able to say Dr. Jeffries is just wonderful. So he is an associate professor of history in the Department of History at The Ohio State University, and he takes great pride in opening students' minds to new ways of understanding the past and the present. He has won many awards, including the Distinguished Teaching Award from The Ohio State Alumni, um, and uh, which is the university's highest commendation for teaching. He is a product of our HBCUs from Morehouse College with a BA in history, and earned his PhD in American history with a specialization in African-American history from Duke University. And it's just so wonderful to have you here. And I'm just gonna pass it on to you and kind of disappear here. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Dr. Garcia, for the, the, the very warm uh, welcome. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate the welcome. I appreciate the invitation uh, to, to be able to share some thoughts and ideas uh, with the Worcester community uh, on this occasion, as the nation turns its attention uh, towards Juneteenth, uh, really for in, in a way that we have not seen ever before. Uh, and, and, and so I think it's really, it's timely uh, and it's important uh, that we gather, that we gather here to, uh, this evening. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I have a few slides that I wanna um, uh, talk through uh, for, for the next 20, 20, 30 minutes or so. Take us to the bottom of the hour. Uh, as Dr. Garcia had pointed out, um, uh, she's uh, uh, gathered some questions. We have the, the Q&A function open. So for those who are uh, watching live, by all means, if you have any questions or comments, please uh, populate the, uh, the Q&A. Uh, and we have folk who are looking at that, keeping an eye on that, and we'll work that in uh, to, the, to the second half uh, of, our, of our time together. So let me go ahead and share my screen. 
There we go. So I've, I've titled my uh, remarks, uh, Juneteenth, a commemoration of celebration, because Juneteenth is really one of several things. It, it, is, it is certainly a day uh, in which we um, uh, mark an occasion, mark a moment, but it is more than that. And what I want to do with the time that I have with you uh, is sort of put Juneteenth into both historic and into contemporary contemporary context. So uh, many of you may be familiar by now uh, with what Juneteenth actually is, what the day was, if you will. On June 19th, 1865 in Galveston, Texas, uh, federal troops led by Union General uh, Gordon Granger uh, land in that south uh, southern part of Texas and deliver the good news, uh, deliver uh, the word that the Civil War is over, uh, that the Confederacy has been defeated, and therefore that slavery has now come to an end. June 19, 1865 represents for those uh, enslaved folk, for those African Americans uh, in Texas who receive that word, uh, the day of Jubilee, uh, the much uh, prayed for day that African Americans uh, hoped would come in their lifetimes, uh, but for which many African Americans, it never did. We have to remember that by 1865, slavery had existed uh, in colonial America and in uh, the United States of America for 250 years, 250 years, two and a half centuries. You have countless generations of African Americans who were born in slavery and died in slavery without ever having the prospect or hope of living uh, without chains. And so this is just an amazing day, an emotional day. Now, this is also a day that comes two months after the actual end of the Civil War uh, in April of 1865 when uh, Confederate uh, General uh, Robert E. Lee uh, surrenders to uh, the Union forces in Appomattox Courthouse, surrender to future President uh, Ulysses S. Grant. And, and with the fall of the Confederacy uh, comes the, the, the end of slavery. Uh, but there is this two month gap uh, between that day uh, and June 19th. And that's partly because of geography. Uh, Texas was the westernmost frontier of the Confederacy. And so without the benefit of the internet, uh, it took time for uh, word to travel uh, that, the, that the Confederacy had been defeated. But even more so than the time it took for word to spread, uh, for word to reach Texas, was the fact that you needed military forces, you needed military troops in order to ensure that former enslaveholders, enslavers abided by uh, the new, the new uh, uh, standard of living, the new way of living, the new status quo. You, you, remembering 250 years uh, of bondage, of slavery, this was the Southern way of life. The Southern way of life was maintaining the institution of slavery. They just fought a war for five years to maintain the institution of slavery. So they just weren't gonna set their people free uh, on the word of somebody uh, coming wearing a blue suit. No, they needed to uh, have that enforced uh, by, uh, by soldiers, many of whom uh, who land in Galveston and who would serve on that Western frontier, enforcing and making sure that slavery uh, was actually uh, abolished uh, and was not reinstituted would be African-American soldiers. So you have this two month gap. This is why it's June 19th and not, uh, and not in April. And also uh, this isn't, this is coming two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. So Abraham Lincoln uh, issues a preliminary Emancipation Proclamation in uh, September of 1863. It would be uh, uh, 100 days later on January 1, or, or September 1862, excuse me, it would be 100 days later on January 1, 1863 that the Emancipation Proclamation goes into effect. But the Emancipation Proclamation, although we call Lincoln the great emancipator, the Emancipation Proclamation actually doesn't emancipate anybody. There are 4 million enslaved folk uh, on, on, on December 31, 1862. 
uh, and there are 4 million enslaved folk on January 1, 1863. And that's because when you read the text of the Emancipation Proclamation, you realize that it was uh, a, a, a olive branch uh, to the Confederacy. Uh, the preliminary proclamation states that if those states that are in rebellion uh, lay down their arms and surrender and come back into the Union, then those states that have slavery can keep their Black folk in bondage. That was the olive branch. Come back in, cease hostilities, and you can keep your enslaved folk. But if you continue to fight, uh, then those enslaved folk in those states that are in rebellion, then I declare as President of the United States, it's this executive order, that those enslaved folk are free. Now, of course, uh, the reason why uh, Lincoln couldn't enforce that is because they were states in rebellion and not under the control of Union forces. And so Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation doesn't actually free anybody. And also because those states uh, that maintain the institution of slavery, and there's a couple of upper South states that did, that were under Union control, Lincoln uh, said that those were exemptions, exceptions, that enslaved folk were not freed there. So sadly and unfortunately, Lincoln does not free, does not end slavery in those states where he actually had the power to do so. Uh, and so we, we, we talk about the Emancipation Proclamation and people celebrate the Emancipation Proclamation, but we kind of celebrate it for the, or recognize it or talk about it for the wrong reasons. One, it, it is important, even though nobody is freed, it's, it's, it's critically important because it turns the tide of the war. After that Emancipation Proclamation goes into effect, this is a war to end slavery. You know, the great irony about the Civil War is that the two sides were fighting for two different objectives initially. Uh, the South was fighting to preserve the institution of slavery. Slavery was the cornerstone of the Confederacy, but the North was not fighting to end it. Uh, Lincoln is quite clear that he has no intention of ending the institution of slavery. He just wants to keep the Southern states as a part of the Union. Uh, but the Southern states understood that any attempts to put boundaries, further boundaries and restrictions on where, where slavery could extend uh, would, uh, would have a detrimental effect on where slavery was. And so the Emancipation Proclamation uh, is in, 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 in essence a military measure uh, because it says now this war is about abolishing slavery and there's no turning back. And because it's about abolishing slavery, that's going to keep foreign countries, particularly Western European countries, England and France, uh, which had already abolished the institution of slavery, that's going to keep them from recognizing the Confederacy. So there's some military strategy there. But then it also uh, will, it also in the Emancipation Proclamation, um, authorizes the U.S. Army, authorizes the U.S. Navy to accept African-American recruits. Uh, and eventually some 180, close to 200,000 African-Americans would wear the blue suit, would wear the Union uniform uh, and fight for Black liberation in the end of slavery. And so it's, a, it, it's the significance of it, uh, the meaningful, the substance of the Emancipation Proclamation was it, it, it raises Black troops who have been trying to get in on this fight from the very beginning. Uh, but it is more symbolic when it comes to emancipation or emancipating, ending slavery, uh, than anything else. So we have to look towards 1865 uh, if, we are, if we want to begin to talk about well, what is the, uh, when do we mark this transition in eras from slavery to freedom? Uh, and then within that, it's when the war ends, but then when, does the, when do the last folk uh, who were in bondage, when do they receive word? When are their shackles finally broken? And that takes us to June 19th. 1865. When we think about um, Juneteenth, uh, and, and, and I think hopefully uh, this will hold the power of this uh, day, the power of, uh, of, of looking back at this moment of emancipation, um, you know, and, and historically the way it has been celebrated and marked within the African-American community, uh, it has been about looking back at the past, looking at the present, and, and also thinking about the future. And the looking back at the past, I think what we should do as well is taking time to pause and, and, and think about the ways in which African-Americans participated in their own emancipation. Uh, we have to recognize black agency. You don't have 4 million enslaved folk uh, who are down in, these, in, 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 in the Confederacy just hoping that 
uh, a white messiah will come liberate them, right? Uh, no, they are, with every opportunity that they get, they are working to uh, find their own freedom. Uh, when union forces get close, we see mass exodus, mass flight. Uh, we see uh, enslaved Africans uh, engaging in sabotage, uh, sending messages, sending information, helping the union forces uh, defeat the Confederacy. We see them, and Du Bois talked about this, engaged in a national strike, a slowdown, slowing down work production because they know that their production is supporting uh, the Confederacy. So the enslaved themselves are fighting for freedom in that moment of uh, the, the Civil War, 1860 to 1865. But even earlier than that, one of the things that's so critically important when we think about Juneteenth and reflect back on this 250 year period of slavery in America from 1619 uh, roughly to 1865 is that African-Americans had always been engaging in resistance. One of, the, one of the central themes of the black experience in America is the persistence of resistance. And so African-Americans are, 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 are fighting back against slavery they are, are fighting against white supremacy. They are fighting for their liberation in a range of ways. You know, sometimes we get caught up looking for the most dramatic ways, looking, looking for examples of rebellion uh, as the only form or most dramatic form of resistance. And there is, there is that. Uh, there's Nat Turner's insurrection attempt in 1831, uh, uh, Gabriel Denmark Vesey uh, in, in 1822, uh, Gabriel Prosser. Uh, in Richmond in, 18, in 1800, the Stono Rebellion, uh, African-Americans in South Carolina uh, in, 17, in 1739. So we see these moments of rebellion, uh, but there aren't that many. And, and they aren't that many, not because Black folk didn't want their freedom. They aren't that many because Black folk understood that engaging in that type of resistance was suicide because they were outnumbered, they were outgunned, and the geography did not work in their favor. And every single attempt of rebellion resulted in the mass execution, torture uh, of, of, of Black folk, those who participated and those who did not. And so most Black folk looked for other ways of fighting against, fighting for their freedom, which included uh, sabotage, which included uh, running away and flight. And here in Ohio, of course, becomes one of the uh, sites that at one of the destinations that African-Americans uh, below the Ohio uh, River are seeking. Wooster has a, a tradition of of serving as a pathway uh, for African-Americans to freedom. And after the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, moving out of places like Worcester into Canada because it was no longer safe uh, in, in, in places where African-Americans, free Blacks, formerly enslaved folk, freedom seekers had settled. So it's critically important that when we think back at this emancipation moment and look at the years before, that we acknowledge the, the, the humanity of enslaved folk calling them enslaved and not just slaves, but recognize their active agency uh, in fighting for their own liberation. And at the same time, free African-Americans, free Blacks as scholars call them, uh, participate in this fight as well. The majority of the 180 so 200,000 African-Americans who, who fought in the uh, Civil War or a great number of them were free Black, but because they understood African-Americans, if you were living in Ohio, even if you were born free in Ohio or born in my home state, uh, of New York, you understood that your, you could not fully enjoy your civil and human rights as long as bondage, as long as slavery, as long as race-based slavery existed somewhere in the United States. And so they are the principal objective for all African-Americans, even free Blacks, uh, before 1865 was ending slavery, was, was, was securing freedom uh, for those who were held in bondage. And so it's not a surprise that you have free Blacks, you have free African-Americans uh, who are clamoring to be a part of the Civil War, who are clamoring to fight for the Union, who are insisting and lobbying and pushing uh, Lincoln and, and others uh, uh, with political power to make this a war about ending slavery. And they finally get their way. They finally convince Lincoln in part because he's suffering some serious battlefield defeats. We know how the war ends, but in 1862, there was no guarantee at all that it was gonna go in this direction. And they make the difference. They help turn the tide by bringing in uh, some additional uh, 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 manpower, literal manpower, black men are armed with guns to participate uh, in, this, in this struggle. So again, thinking about this moment and what Juneteenth is, you know, it is about 
the ways in which Black folk uh, were fighting uh, for their own liberation, were engaged in self-liberation. If African-Americans were fighting for freedom, a literal freedom up until 1865, Juneteenth provides us an opportunity to think about what happens after emancipation. We do a disservice to the to this anniversary, to this commemorative moment, if we just look at the moment or even just look before it, we have to look at this transition uh, because two things are happening. One, uh, although slavery ends, and this is critically important, and, and this is why I'm so glad we are focusing attention on Juneteenth because we have to look at Juneteenth, the emancipation moment, but what is the legacy of slavery uh, and the principal legacy of slavery in America is the persistence of the ideology that justified it in the first place. And that ideology is white supremacy, manifested in different ways. Sometimes it's uh, religious absurdities, the curse of ham and all this other stuff. Sometimes it's biological absurdities. Sometimes it's cultural absurdities. Black folk are incapable of living on their own and all this other stuff. But the bottom line is it's all justified by white supremacy. It's just variations on a theme, variations of white supremacy. And so when slavery ends, too often in the classroom, we, we say, well, I guess the equality pro, uh, proceeded after that. Like, no, hardly. Uh, slavery ends, white supremacy continues. The belief in white supremacy does not dissipate. The belief in white supremacy is still there. And that informs actions towards African-Americans. So Southern whites, although they had lost the mechanisms of slavery to control Black, black labor, they look for uh, and seek out uh, new mechanisms, new political systems, new economic structures so that they could control black labor, so that they could continue to reap the benefits of free black labor. Uh, and so one of the legacies coming out of uh, the emancipation moment that we have to pay attention to is the persistence in a belief in white supremacy because that informs what we would see going the color line uh, for the next 150 years up until the present. But again, we have to take seriously African-Americans as political thinkers and political actors on their own and be clear uh, that at the moment of emancipation, African-Americans immediately begin to pursue uh, what I call freedom rights, a combination of civil rights and human rights that they identified, not because somebody told them that this is what they should be doing, that they identified because they knew that these civil rights, this, 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 this range of civil and human rights were the ones that they had been denied while they were being held in bondage. And they knew that these were important to freedom, to what it meant to be free, because nobody understood better what it meant to be free, what civil rights and human rights you needed to live as a free human being in society than enslaved folk, because they were denied these basic rights, the right to read, the right to assemble, uh, the right to uh, religious worship, the right to the fruits of your own labor. They were denied these basic rights and yet were living in the presence of people who enjoyed them. And so, you know, you, we could talk about James Madison, uh, the architect of the Bill of Rights uh, and say, well, you know, he's, he's drawing on books uh, of the great uh, 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 enlightenment thinkers uh, to come up with these core protections or core rights that the government cannot tread upon. Yeah, he's reading those volumes, but he's also just looking out of his window because James Madison uh, was a third generation enslaver, uh, held more than 100 people in bondage over the course of his lifetime, and he never freed a single soul, not even upon his death. If he wanted to know what rights are, are people, uh, do people need protected uh, in order to maintain their freedom, uh, all he had to do was think about the list of rights that he was keeping from the people that he was holding in chains. Uh, and those enslaved folk uh, who were in bondage to Madison, they didn't need to read um, the Bill of Rights to know what critical rights that they were lacking and that were essential to freedom because all they had to do was think about the things they could not do on the penalty of death uh, in the living on the in the slave labor camp managed and controlled by uh, uh, James Madison. So when we think about uh, Juneteenth, we have to think about that slave past and slave, the, the past of slavery, but also that emancipation moment because that emancipation moment where we have the persistence of white supremacy, but we also have African-Americans articulating this freedom rights agenda. That moment sets the broader agenda for freedom that African-Americans will pursue for the next 150 years. African-Americans didn't start uh, demanding justice for the victims of racial terrorism and police violence uh, in 2020. They're talking about that uh, in 1865. And so these become variations on a theme 
uh, although the context changes over time, it's important that we situate and recognize uh, the continuum that they exist on. Juneteenth really has three components, and, and one is a day of remembrance, just as I was talking about, remembering the institution of slavery for what it was. This was not some necessary evil, it was just evil. This was not some benign system, it was a violent system uh, in which African Americans lose their lives at the will and whim of those who are holding them in bondage, but they also can suffer this sort of social death, uh, this separation, family members being sold apart, and some one million African Americans are forcibly separated uh, from their family members uh, between 1800 and 1865 through a domestic slave trade, selling uh, black folk from the upper south of Virginia, Maryland, these other places down into the deep south, into Texas, into Alabama, into uh, Mississippi and Louisiana. And so historically, the Juneteenth celebration was a day to remember those who had suffered through the institution of slavery, including those family members who have been separated and sold away. So it's a solemn event uh, in, in, in some aspect. Uh, Juneteenth was also historically celebrated, and, and that, that celebration begins immediately, you know, right after uh, uh, in, in 1865 and 1866, 1867, we see that Juneteenth being celebrated in Texas. We see Emancip January 1, Emancipation Day celebrations uh, being held uh, in Ohio, uh, in Massachusetts, in New York, uh, celebrating the, that the day the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect, because that is that turning point, as I said, uh, in Florida uh, in the 19 teens, 1920s. We see Emancipation Day celebrations occurring in February tied to Lincoln's birthday. And one of the critical moments of all these commemorative events uh, was celebrating and acknowledging black soldiers, African-Americans who fought in the Civil War. Uh, there are parades in which black soldiers are honored as they march through uh, and later on are wheeled through as they get older. I mean, this was for African-Americans for 50 years after emancipation, this was that centuries, uh, the 19th centuries, um, a greatest generation. Uh, and, and so they are honored as such. This is an image uh, of one of the folk uh, who participated uh, in the liberation of Black people. Uh, and that is Harriet Tubman, who's standing on the far left. Not only uh, was she a conductor on the Underground Railroad, uh, but she was also very much uh, a, 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 a soldier in the Civil War, serving as a, as a spy for the Union Army, leading sorties out of Hilton Head Island in South Carolina into the hinterland. Uh, in order to uh, gain intelligence that she then brought back to Union forces, the Black troops uh, that then went in to liberate African Americans from plantation. So this day of commemoration of Black folk fighting uh, on the uh, for the U.S. but also for for, for fighting for freedom uh, is one of the is that second component uh, of the of, of Juneteenth. And the third component is that Juneteenth was a day of celebration. This is an image from Texas of 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 Black folk who were uh, in a parade, right? So you have these parades. So it's a solemn moment, but it's also a day of celebration. And this is a critical thing. People are like, man, well, you know, what are Black folk? Well, black folk having a barbecue, right? Life is stressful. It's the height, the height of Jim Crow. And even now, right, life is stressful. So sometimes you just got to sit back and just chill and relax and have some music, right? Like food and, food and drink and dance, right? And music and parade. And this was one of those times where Black folk got together and they were able just to relax. They were able to, to show off a little bit, right? To, to, to come together, uh, to, to smile, to love. Uh, and so Juneteenth as a day of celebration is, is really important. Uh, you know, July 4th is, 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 the, is America's day of celebration, of, of relaxing and chilling. But for Black folk, you always had that tension. It was like, ah, this didn't apply to me, right? For 150, 400, 400, you know, almost 100 years. Uh, and so there's always been that ambivalence uh, certainly, after, even after emancipation, because you have Jim Crow and discrimination and all these other things. So Juneteenth is, is sort of the, for Black folk, uh, and, and partly why it continues on while the other Emancipation Day celebrations begin to wane is because it is so close to July 4th, uh, and it provided Black folk this opportunity uh, to come together to celebrate, uh, to relax, uh, and then to continue on to struggle, to struggle for freedom. And this last slide, and then uh, I will, you know, open it up for those those, those questions and bring uh, in, uh, that Dr. Garcia has has brought together. We have to connect the past to the present. Uh, we do a disservice to all those who 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 established who, who who lived in slavery, who lived in that transition from slavery to freedom. Uh, if we do not connect the past to the present, if we do not link 
uh, that effort to, to secure, to end slavery, to secure freedom, uh, to secure freedom rights, if we do not link that effort uh, to the effort of black folk uh, during the civil rights and the black power era uh, to, to, to give full meaning to emancipation. This is a hundred years after the civil rights move, after slavery ended and black folk are still trying to give meaning to emancipation. Uh, and then some 50, 60 years after that, you have black folk still trying to give meaning to emancipation. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement that has emerged, the, the largest protest that occurred uh, in, in, in US history this past summer, uh, that is an extension of the efforts of African-Americans to make America a more perfect union. And you can only do that if you recognize the persistence of inequality tied to uh, racism born of the institution of slavery that we still have not fully reconciled with. And so during this time where we can pause and reflect, it is important that we do that, uh, that we do it in a way that, 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 that allows a little black joy to come to the forefront. But it's also important that we say, how can we continue the work of bringing freedom to all people? How can we continue the work of extending full civil rights and human rights to all people? How can we fulfill the revolutionary promise of the, uh, of the American Revolution that fell short in 1776, that got a little closer uh, in 1865, that got a little closer in 1965, but still isn't there yet in 2021? Juneteenth gives us an opportunity uh, to think about that and then eventually to learn more about the past uh, so that we can act responsibly so that we can act effectively uh, to make uh, America uh, a better place, to live up to those ideals that have been on paper, uh, but have yet to be realized. And so with that, I say thank you very much uh, for your attention and, and, and I welcome uh, Dr. Garcia back. Yes, I wanna give you a standing ovation sitting down and on the Zoom. Um, uh, format that Thank was um, that was amazing, and we have some really great questions that are coming in. So I wanted to start to your point about what what is next, right? What hasn't yet happened? How do we fulfill that promise? A lot of Black scholars are pointing out that the United States, the federal government, has, as of today, I believe, uh, President Biden signed the bill uh, uh. making Juneteenth a federal holiday. And but right, this is at a time when states like Texas and other states um, are outlawing critical race theory, um, are um, making voting harder for Black people and BIPOC people, and uh, and the um, and there are a lot of movements across different states, right, to um, make it harder for um, Black people to exercise their rights and or to, to even talk about, to your point, like, and I love the way that you say it, and I, I really appreciate it also your use of slave labor camp instead of plantations mm -hmm. or cotton, you know, whatever, you know, the idea of a slave labor camp is so precise uh, where a plantation just sounds kind of mm -hmm. romantic, right? Or mm -hmm. romanticized. So I appreciate the, the uh, corrections of language. But anyway, coming back to this question, how do you see that that concern, right, by many Black yeah. scholars that here it is the United States getting credit for making Juneteenth a federal holiday <laughs> when states are moving purposefully to yeah. divest Black people from their rights, divest Black people from the ability to teach their scholarship? Yeah, yeah no, that's that's such an important question, um, and 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 I think I think the key word that you use is purposeful. Right, because this is intentional and, 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 and it's also very political. So on the one hand, you know, I, I don't want people to say because all of that is occurring and it is occurring for the exact same reasons that you're talking about, right? All of that is occurring. I don't want people to dismiss the significance of making Ju recognizing Juneteenth because that is, that is important uh, because we do not have a, a, a nationally recognized moment in which we acknowledge the horrors of the past and the struggles of Black folk to make this country a little bit better, right? Um, and uh, you know, you know, we have MLK, but I mean, again, people that that's you know that's sort of twentieth century. But this is a, we got to deal with the two hundred fifty years of slavery. So Juneteenth really does allow for that to occur. But with anything, 
it, it, it is symbolic, right? And, and although it is symbolic, and because it is symbolic, it is modest, but it's meaningful, right? So, and that's important. It's like, you know, tear, tearing down those statues and monuments to white supremacy. They're modest means, but they are meaningful. Nobody is going to be lifted out of poverty because Biden signed uh, the, the Juneteenth federal holiday, right? I, I, I get that. I understand that. But it is a place, it is a time, it is an opportunity for us to say, hey, let's look at this nation. And, and, and the reason why, in, 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 in all of its glory, as well as all of its faults. And you know, the, the politics behind the, this sort of anti-critical race hysteria and all of this has everything to do with what Juneteenth actually prods us to do, which is to think not just about what happened then, but also how what happened then continues to inform, shape the lives of people today. And that's exactly what these anti-critical race theory folk, really just anti-Black folk, anti-anti-racism folk want. They're saying, look, if we can get people to say that racism isn't real, that structural racism doesn't exist, then guess what? Then we as elected officials don't have to deal with it. We don't have to come up with policies to address it. Right. So the great irony is like now we're going to have a national holiday on Juneteenth that you can't teach in Texas. Right. I mean, just the, the disconnect is insane, but we have to. But it's also very dangerous because it's silencing. Right. I mean, it, it will create this, this, this pressure on teachers and others not to talk about this, not to talk about the truth. And that's all it is. We need to talk about the truth. And so it, it, it's, it's, it's a it's it, it, it's it's America's schizophrenia. Uh, but we also have to recognize that the, the default for America has always been sort of inequality, like the status quo, right? Like you know, Dr. King always talked about bending the arc of the moral universe, right? The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Yeah, if you exert a force necessary to bend it in that direction. And Juneteenth provides an opportunity to educate people so that they understand that a, a force needs to be exerted to bend it towards justice. Otherwise, you yield ground to those like uh, those state legislators across the country who are saying don't teach about race and racism in the classroom, who are engaged in active efforts to undermine democracy uh, by passing these uh, voter suppression laws. So, you know, we acknowledge it, we appreciate it. Uh, it's modest, but it's meaningful, but it doesn't, we ought not keep our eye off the ball uh, in terms of the work and action that still needs to be done. I told this last thing I talked, I talked to a uh, reporter for the New York Times, she, uh, uh, LA Times, that she called earlier today, and she said, could you explain what the appetite is for Juneteenth? Like, where did this come from? I said, you know, Black people have been trying to get Juneteenth recognized, right? I mean, for 150 years. And I said, but coming out of 2020, those protests in which the language and the, the popular discourse changed, like, look, we got to deal with systemic racism. Well, you know, this becomes a modest way to acknowledge that, okay, we got to acknowledge the past because that was part of those protests too. Let's look at the past. We got to acknowledge the past. But I hope it's not an appetite suppressant for dealing with the issues uh, that we have to deal with going forward. Absolutely. Excellent. So we have an audience member who asked a really um, personal question that I think is also really uh, apropos to that black white divide, right, of the United States. Um, uh, this audience member was saying that, you know, now Juneteenth is officially a federal holiday as a federal employee. They will be observing Juneteenth tomorrow um, and don't have to work. But a white colleague of this audience member made a comment that she felt like she couldn't or shouldn't observe because Juneteenth does not apply to her. Mm. Mm. Like, so the question is, um, uh, wait, somebody took my question away. Um, and the question is, how can we convey to white Americans that Juneteenth is a holiday that we all should get behind and celebrate regardless yeah. of race? Yeah, yeah no, that's critical. It, it, it's so essential that, that white folks don't take a pass on this, right? It's like, ah, this has nothing to do with me. Of course it has to do with you because this is the nation. The nation finally, got that part of the American Revolution right, the part that it had left out. So if you feel that you can celebrate July 4th, then you can celebrate June 19th. Absolutely, because it's on the continuum. Now, it's just that Black people were the ones who had kept this idea going, who wouldn't let America forget 
about the institution of slavery when it was trying to put it behind you, when it was trying to put it behind her, right? It, and so like, don't get so caught up, you know, and saying, well, this is just about slavery and then the slavery and I had nothing to do with it. No, America was responsible for the institution of slavery. So all Americans need to observe and use this as an opportunity to learn. Look, this is the one barbecue, the one cookout that white people are invited to, right? Come on, right? Come on, you can come, leave your potato salad at home, but come on, right? Come to the barbecue, get some food and learn something. Learn something about not just sort of black culture and community, learn something about American history, right? Which would then, so, so, so that you're prepared when these, when these silly legislators come about and start talking about, well, we're not gonna talk about slavery. Like, no, 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 how are you not? Because you learned this on this occasion. So no, this is definitely for everybody. And it's that moment to learn, not just sleep late or shop or, or, or shop for some sales, right? But to learn and, and then eventually hopefully act on it. Great, excellent. One of our amazing Wooster students um, gave us this question, which is along the same lines of like, you know, how do we make these events more participatory? Yeah. And she asked, how can the African diaspora play a part in support of Black America? Because we often feel left out and secluded from this history. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's important. And, and it's important, the, the, the connections between the Black community, African Americans, those who were enslaved here, and the, and the more contemporary African diaspora is really important. African Americans, people were born here, came from Africa. Right? I mean, it just came a little bit earlier, right? So, I mean, so one, you got to understand and folks have to th th understand that, that relationship and that connection. It's also important to realize that the African-American struggle for freedom has always had a diasporic component. Uh, when we look at the, the early 20th century or mid 20th century and the influence of the civil rights movement on black consciousness movements, uh, when we think about the Pan-Africanist meetings uh, that were being held, international Pan-Africans meetings that Du Bois and others were leading. When we think about the efforts of African-Americans to emigrate, right, one of the critical components during the era of slavery, one of the options, people were like, man, this is never going to change. Like, we got to go, right? And so there has always been this diasporic connection. Uh, Gabriel Prosser's, and this is not just Africa, but also the African diaspora, Gabriel Prosser's rebellion in 1800 was inspired in part by the Haitian Revolution which scares the hell out of Thomas Jefferson, right? And so he's like, yo, we really do gotta end this slave trade. I mean, so there's always this diasporic connection. And I think it's really important, especially because so much of what the rest of the world knows about black folk is are these stereotypes that have been projected out um, to the world through media. I mean, this has been going on for generations, right? Aunt Jemima, a syrup wasn't just being sold in, in, in New York City, right? I mean, this is global. And so it requires sort of education on the parts of everyone, right? Education on the parts of those who were born in the continent and diaspora or who are moving here, who have been bombarded by stereotypes about what black culture, local American black culture is, but also some education on the part of African-Americans because of the way Africa, you know, President of the United States talking about Nigeria as a shithole nation, right? Because of the way Africa has been portrayed. So there has to be a lot of learning, has to be a lot of unlearning, and has to be a lot of coming together. Uh, because those from the African diaspora, if you got a little bit of color and you stay here long enough, uh, then you're going to be lumped right in with the rest of us, right? So there is some shared uh, a future uh, and there's some shared um, experiences uh, and that we all benefit when we come together and also recognize that shared heritage. Awesome. Thank you. So we have another question from the audience that um, asks, how do you see, if at all, that the higher numbers of applicants to historically black colleges and universities uh, may relate to the United States now recognizing Juneteenth more fully? How can you put those two together? Yeah, you know, we saw, and I, as you mentioned earlier, I'm a graduate of HBCU. Um, you know, there have been ebbs and flows in sort of applications, right? I mean, African Americans with, with, with HBCUs were pretty much their only option. Uh, as we move into the era of desegregation, those numbers begin to decline. Uh, really, into the 1970s and the early 1980s, applicants and the population of Black colleges decline as as more schools, College of Worcester, right, begins to accept more and more African Americans. There is an uptick in African American attendance at Black colleges, and I was part of this generation in the late 80s, early 90s. That was also a period of heightened sort of Black consciousness and Black nationals within the Black community, and then that begins to dip. 
right? We see it dipping, you know, in, in, in the 2000s uh, as affirmative action continues to grow strong. But then what happens? In the early 2000s, you have hard cutbacks on affirmative action, making it more difficult to attend uh, 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 PWIs, principally white, historically white, um, uh, predominantly white institutions. Uh, the black enrollment at Ohio State uh, declines precipitously from 15% to 5% uh, over a 10 year period, starting from 2003, 2004. So it becomes harder to attend uh, uh, um, uh, predominantly white um, institutions. Uh, but then we get the Donald Trump era, right? And this had been building. Uh, and so it, it is, it, it, you're starting with sort of that Tea Party insurgency where it becomes more acceptable to be more racist publicly. That is, kids are feeling that. They're feeling that hostility in their elementary and middle schools. They're feeling that hostility in their high schools. And so we see it almost immediately in 2016, 2017, 20, 2018, while we're seeing declines in enrollment and projections and uh, 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 prominently uh, 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 white institutions, it's surging among black colleges, right? Because black kids are like, man, to hell with this, right? I don't want to deal with this, right? And it's not all across the board. I mean, you know, Howard has, you know, most applications that it's ever had, more and Spellman are going up, but it is a response, right, to the nonsense, right, for, for, for uh, that, 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 that black students have to face. Uh, and, and they're looking to these black colleges and saying, look, I need a space where I can just learn. Right, the the you know, uh, we think about for going saying why do all the black kids sit together in the cafeteria, right? When they're in the predominantly white, that's because being around white people twenty five hours a day is exhausting, right? It, 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 it takes energy, and so this is the moment of escape. And and it's not that as a graduate of a black college, of course you're learning there. I mean, nobody's pretending that this is some you know utopia, right? That you just live outside of the world, but it provides this opportunity where look, I can just study, I can just be myself. I don't have to constantly be on a defensive when it comes to who I am as a human being. Uh, and the as we saw this uptick in, in racist behavior, racist talk, and those microaggressions connect because it became more acceptable because of what was happening at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, you saw that. And that also led to that surge in protests on the streets uh, of 2020. Uh, and so I think we connect all three of those, the white supremacy, the white supremacy being uh, more acceptable the, the protests uh, that are occurring where folk are like, look, we're gonna take, we're gonna change this place. Uh, Juneteenth as a, rec as, as a response to those protests saying, yeah, there is systemic racism and we need to acknowledge that. And, and, and it, you know, it will change, I think as a society changes, right? I mean, it will ebb and flow. There will still uh, always be a place for historically black colleges, uh, but right now it is the beneficiary, at least in terms of application of the context in which we live. Uh, both a response to the negative, but then also a response to the positive. This idea that you know black solidarity is important, uh, and I need to tap into that, and that has something to offer me as a young black person as I begin to understand, make sense, and navigate the world. Yeah, that is that uh, awesome. I, you know, and and I always find so interesting. You know, in Dr. Tatum's work, right? Why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? that I always wondered like, why don't any, why doesn't anyone ask, why aren't the, all the white people sitting together? Because they're all sitting together and some That's are, right. you know, the, you know, the, 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 this club or the other club, but it's, they don't, nobody worries about that segregation, right. but it's when BIPOC students sit together that then, oh, they're segregating because they can tell, right? right? So yes, absolutely. absolutely. And, in keeping with this notion of whiteness, we have a question, right? Um, in terms of for white audience members asking, you know, if you could give us three of the most impactful, and I'm gonna add anti-racist initiatives for white Americans to accomplish now and forward, what would those be? Well, you know, I, I think they go back to in the immediate moment, like context is always really important. I think two things that that can be that can be done right now that we need to be talking about immediately. One is this assault on intelligence, <laughs> this assault on history, the politicization of history that that is happening with these state legislators, with these state legis legis late, this legislative action coming out of state legislatures. And Ohio has a bill uh, that's trying to work its way on a committee um, that is do it's just a copy of the cat bill for all of these things. I mean, that's critically important because if you keep 
people from knowing, if you silence people, uh, then we can never create the change that we need because people won't understand the need for the change. And, and, this, and, and the history aspect is so important. And I say this as a history professor, um, but it's so important because we study the past to make sense of the present. And as, as, as educators, as teachers, we are charged with helping our students understand the past so they can make sense of the present so that, we're, so that they can fix the problems that we're leaving them in the future. And if we don't talk honestly about the past, if we don't talk honestly about the impact of race and racism in American society, then our kids will not understand the, how, why these racial disparities exist today. And they won't be prepared to address them in the future. So you know, what can we do in this moment? Or we can push back against that. And it's not just gonna be about the legislative bills, even if that doesn't go through. We know now that this, that this extremely conservative, extremely racist base is so animated that they are putting pressure on teachers, they are putting pressure on, on school districts, they are putting pressure on superintendents and principals not to talk about this stuff. And so get involved with those communities and provide the teachers the assistance, the backing, the, 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 the strength, the support to say, no, 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 we have your back, right? I mean, you can do that with your class. If, you're, if you have children or if you're in a school, just say, no, 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 I'm with you, I'm standing. We're not gonna let this mess fly. We're gonna teach our kids the truth uh, and, and we're going to support you in doing that. So we can do that. I mean, that's that's right now. That's happening right now. Just as those voter suppression bills are happening right now. Like, do not. It, 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 and this isn't just, it certainly is Black folk leading the charge on this. And it's directed at picking off Black folk. But this is about democracy, right? And if you are, if you believe in democracy, then you can't support these voter suppression efforts that are happening across the country and that are happening right here, uh, potentially in, in Ohio. So that, those are two things that you can do right now that would be impactful. And it's not just, you know, part of it, you know, write your legislature, but it's also get involved on the ground to, 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 to help teachers, to help activists, make sure that people have unfettered access to the ballot and that, te that, that people have unfettered access to the ballot and that people uh, can learn, that teachers can learn, teach the truth, students can learn the truth. And, and I think lastly, uh, for, and this applies to anybody, have conversation, engage in dialogue, with those members you are most immediately around. And that's and this is especially important for white people. Black people, we talk about this stuff all the time, right? We, we've been talking about Juneteenth since 1865, right? There ain't no surprise to us, right? I mean, this is what we do. We talk about this stuff because we can't escape it, right? White privilege allows you to not, you know, pretend like this stuff doesn't exist. And so to have conversation with family members who will never, I will never be in conversation with. Black folk, we still live in this rigidly segregated world. And so white people have access to other white people Right, that black people and other people of color do not have access to, and they won't listen to us even if we did. Right, so you can have this opportunity to take what you learn and share that information, and which is also really important, uh, Dr. Garcia, in this moment of disinformation, right, where so much untruth, so many lies are being accepted as truth that 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 people don't trust. And this is again par partly a problem we've been building towards this, but partly a product of the last four years. You know, who are they going to listen to? Hopefully they'll listen to you if they don't listen to us. Thank you so much, Dr. Jeffries. As always, the hour has flown by and it is time to say goodbye. And thank you to the audience who, who provided questions. Thank you to the audience that participated in the Q&A. And thank you so much, Dr. Jeffries, always for your clarity, for your vocabulary, for your enthusiasm, and for really just being very um, passionate about this, and you know, um, you know how they say they use the word infecting with passion, but infecting has a bad notion right now. So I'm going <laughs> to say, you know, passing on right in a good way that passion and that commitment that it is upon all of us, especially yeah. those of us who are white and white presenting, to make sure that Juneteenth, the reason that it's a federal holiday. It's because everyone in this nation should be aware of that true history, as you're saying. Yeah. Instead of Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the invitation. Um, good luck to everyone and happy, happy Juneteenth. Yes, happy Juneteenth, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us.